Paul to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 12 to 18, and then Abdul is going to come and teach for us. And Paul writes this, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Can we give Abdullah a big round of applause as he comes to the back of us? Amen. Morning, everyone. I've been told by a very wise friend that until you've had lunch, you can still say good morning. Uh, you're watching, I know. Okay, how are we doing? Doing well? Good, okay, good. Okay, as Daniel said, we are continuing in our Together for the Gospel series from Paul's letter to the Philippines. And in the past few weeks, we have heard that how this was the first church that was started in Europe. God did some amazing things by opening the eyes of this businesswoman, Lydia, and uh, orchestrating the salvation of this Philippine jailer. And when they came together, the church started. And even though they were poor, they were tremendously faithful. They were generous, they were faithful, they were compassionate towards Paul. And when they heard that Paul was in prison in Rome, they sent this man called Epaphroditus with the gifts that they wanted to give to Paul. And Paul was now writing this letter as a response to their generosity. So he started with his introduction, he, he said thank you very much for your gift, he wrote about them, how he feels about them, and now we reach the point where Paul is, the, is writing the body of the letter where he has the opportunity to write how he's doing, how he's feeling, how he's suffering and all of that. So this is, this is what he writes, Philippians chapter 1. Verse 12 onwards. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that my condition here is really bad. The rented apartment that they have given me doesn't have proper ventilation. I don't even have a garden. Food? Oh, good that you ask. I was going to ask Epaphroditus if he could get some food and fill my freezer because the food that I get here is just awful. And it's getting quite comfortable day by day. There's more. I've asked for some paracetamols, some myoprofins, some tetanus injections, which I hope are on their way. Man, these guys are so slow. He doesn't write anything of that sort. He doesn't write anything about his own condition, his own suffering, how he's, how's, how he's under house arrest, how he's being chained to a Roman soldier 24-7. How he, on his way to Rome, he, he suffered shipwreck, he was in a terrible storm, he was bitten by a snake. He doesn't choose to write all of that. Mm. What he chooses to write is this. My dear brothers, the gospel is advancing. That does not mean that he is living in some sort of denial from his circumstances. But there is a different perspective that he is living with. There is something else going on in his heart and his mind. And the thing that takes priority in Paul's life is faithful following and faith-filled proclamation of this gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, even in this little passage, this chapter, we can see by manner of repetition, we can see that how he keeps bringing up the gospel over and over again. It's proclamation, it's advance over and over again. Verse 3 to 5, he writes, I thank my God for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 7, I hold you in my heart because you are partakers with me in the gospel. Verse 12, he writes again, all that has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. 
Verse 27, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Stand side by side and strive for the faith of the gospel. Now what is this gospel? What is this good news of Jesus Christ? And I would suggest that to understand this good news of Jesus Christ, we need to understand what's the bad news. And I would say that this is the bad news, that we, you and I, in our own selves, we were separated from God. We were separated from God. You, you, know, you know how it started. God made Adam and Eve, and he made them to be, uh, to, to be together, to be physically and spiritually connected with God. That's how he made him. And he said, when, if you obey, remain in my love, remain in my obedience, and you will live. You disobey, and you die. That's what God said. And we know that Adam and Eve disobeyed. So even though physically they were alive, Spiritually, the connection, the spiritual connection between God and them was completely broken. And they were spiritually dead. Every human born on the face of the earth from then on is, is born spiritually separated and away because of this disobedience, because of this sin in our lives. And that's bad news. What makes it even more bad that there is no rules or regulations, there is no list, to-do list, that we can carry on and say, okay, this is how I can meet with God. This is how I can be reconciled to God. There is nothing of that sort. And that is bad news. Can something be done? Yes. Yes, the answer is found in this person of Jesus Christ. This God who, 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 was, who was God, who took on human flesh. He became a man and he entered into human history. He took on human flesh and he became a man. He lived that perfectly obedient life that you and I could have never lived. And then he died on the cross and he gave his life for us as a ransom. So that you and I can be reconciled back to God. Amen. Whoever puts their trust in Jesus, this death on the cross, this resurrection from the dead, is reconciled back to God. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And it was for this good news that Paul was sold out completely. Paul was sold out completely. This is the news that Paul was so passionate to spread. That we don't get, we don't get this by following a to-do list. This is a gift from God. This is you get by grace through faith in Jesus. And it's a gift from God. Right. And Paul is so confident that all that he is going through, being under house arrest, being changed to a Roman soldier, all that is going through is happening for the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, this is what he really writes. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Mm. Has really served to advance the gospel. Amazing to see how God chooses to, chooses to use even our sufferings, even, our, even the bad things that happen to us for the advance of his kingdom. Amazing to see that. I mean, we don't have to go very far off to see that. Just look at the life that we have lived in the past year. Just look at that life, because, because of this pandemic, we have been affected in so many different ways. Yes, we couldn't, uh, uh, we couldn't meet together as a family. We couldn't meet together as a community physically. We were far away from our families and friends for a prolonged period of time. But there was something much deeper going on in, in families, in life, that God was doing. I mean, even from my own life, there have been uh, relationships that are sort of being restored due to this time together. Our neighbors, there have been some meaningful conversations over the fence from our neighbors. We should find Isaac and our neighbor, who's a three-year-old daughter. They have almost collectively broke one of the panels of the friends to, in order to keep their chatting going. Because because they wanted to be together. They want, there, was, there were conversations going, there was something, something good happening, there was love being shared over the fence. And my dear friends, we were isolated. We were in there, we were locked down, we were quarantined. But the gospel of God was advancing and is still advancing. Mm. We prayed for India. We prayed for India. They're, they are in lockdown right now, but the gospel of God is still Advancing. Amen. That truth does not change. Amen. Whatever the circumstances. And here I believe Paul shows us at least three different ways in which the gospel advances. Even through our difficult circumstances. 
God, the first thing, the first word I would suggest, he says that the gospel advances out of his chains. The gospel advances out of Paul's chains. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Let's talk about this imperial guards for a moment. This was an elite Roman military unit. The, Ro uh, the soldiers were handpicked. Some historians say that their number was limited to 9,000 only. They were given some double pays, good pensions, special duties. They were given leadership positions in the Roman Empire. They were called king makers. They also served as bodyguards to the Roman Emperor. They were quite powerful in Rome. And Paul was chained to one of these for 24 hours a day for two years. And historians again say that they worked a typical four, hour, four to six hours shift. So there were four soldiers that were chained to, to, uh, to Paul in 24 hours, multiplied by two years. That's the number of people that Paul had the opportunity to share the gospel, to speak continuously for all those two years. The gospel was advancing and this is how it was advancing. This is how it was advancing. So even if they were not talking to Paul, even if Paul was not talking to them continuously about Jesus, he was not sharing the gospel continuously uh, with them, what they were doing is they were looking at Paul's life. They were looking at how his joyfulness. They were looking at his joy in Christ. They were looking at his, his good days and bad days. They were looking at him kneeling. They were looking at him standing. He, he was doing everything with them around. So even though it looks like that Paul was chained to them, in reality, they were chained to Paul. Yeah. Paul had that captive audience in front of him to share the gospel and to keep speaking, not just from his mouth, but also through his actions. I mean, they would have looked over the shoulders, what Paul is writing, what is he writing in the letters to the churches? Even this Philippian church, they were thinking, hmm, this is what he's writing. This is how they heard Christ. And like we pray for the government of our nation, I'm sure, Church of Rome, the Christians in the church, they pray for powerful officials in the Roman government to be touched with the gospel. They, will never, they never expected God to answer their prayers in such a way that they would be, the members of the Praetorian Guard or the Imperial Guard would be chained to Paul for two years. Now here's the big question, did it work? Did these powerful men come to Christ? Yes, it did. Many of them became Christians. And then they shared the gospel with their families. And then they shared the gospel with the households of Caesar. How do we know that? Because this is what Paul writes towards the end of the letter. He says, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. And when the Philippian church would have read this, like, wow, Caesar's household are followers of Christ. There might be cooks, there might be servants, there might be others, but they're still part of Caesar's household. They're following Christ. Amazing, how did that happen? This is how it happened. Paul was chained to the members of the Imperial Guard 24-7 for two years. The gospel advanced from there. The gospel advanced from there. Now what does that look like for you and me in 2021? I would say that some of us feel chained to our circumstances, our situations. Some of you might feel chained to your work desk. Some of you might feel chained to um, to your homes. You're not able to come out of the houses. Stay inside. Stay indoors. Some of the little ones might be, might be feeling chained to a desktop or a laptop, finishing off their schoolwork. Some of you might be feeling chained to your housemates, and you have to, have to stay in. Still others might feel, some of our family members would be chained to, to hospital beds. God had anchored Paul in prison for one reason, for the advancement of the gospel. And I would say that God is chaining us, if, if that's how you feel, God has chained you, God has put you, God has anchored you and fixed you in that place for this one reason, for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of us have, have moved nations, have come from different nations, from Brazil, from India, from different locations. And some of that was planned maybe, and some of that was like suddenly happened. Oh, my plan is being changed. But that does not mean that God's plan is being changed. Or God's plan is being changed. 
Being in the Roman prison was not part of uh, Paul's plan. It was part of God's plan though, because that's how God had seen it. advanced the gospel from there. Let's keep sharing the love of God with people around us because He has placed us, anchored us, fixed us in the place that we are right now. And that is how the gospel advances out of Paul's chains. And that is how, how I would say that it's, uh, through our circumstances and our situations, God does the same thing. The gospel advances. Secondly, I would say the gospel advances out of bold witness. The gospel advances out of bold examples. Verse 14, Paul writes, Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And after these, after these Jesus followers in Rome heard about Paul's brave witness to the imperial guards, of course they were encouraged in their faith. Of course they were encouraged and lifted up and inspired by looking at what, what was happening inside the prison with Paul. Roman Christians being fearful to speak about Jesus in the city of Rome was quite understandable because in, the, in approximately two years the city would burn, a large portion of the city would burn because of Nero's lunacy, would reach its peak and he would blame the Christians to do that, he would make them the scapegoat. So there was a lot of hostility even towards Christians even in this day. Nero was demanding that he, be, he should be worshipped as God whereas these Christians wanted to worship Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So to avoid all of this trouble, it, was, it made sense to them that, okay, let's keep our faith hidden. Let's keep it to ourselves. But God used Paul's imprisonment to change that. God used Paul's imprisonment to change that. When Roman Christians saw what Paul was doing inside the prison, being chained to a Roman, to a Roman soldier, to these members of Imperial Guard, they said, wow, we are being encouraged by this faith that of course, if he is doing it inside the prison, we can do much more outside the prison. We can be emboldened. And Paul writes that they were emboldened. Majority of them were made much more bold in sharing their faith. And that's the kind of thing that happens to us as well, isn't it? I mean, personally speaking, we have been, we as in me and Nan, we both have been inspired and encouraged by seeing some of the things that, that have been happening in your life. The way things are, things are going on in your life and hearing your stories, we are encouraged and strengthened in ourselves. There has been surely a course involved in following Christ for us as a family. By the way, that, doesn't, that shouldn't come as a surprise because Jesus said that in this life you will have troubles. In this life you will have troubles. You will be ridiculed and mocked on account of my name. So that doesn't, even though that doesn't come as a surprise to us, but it still hurts. And when I look at the stories and, the, and some of the things that have been happening in your life, that strengthens us, that and myself both. I look at Amir, I look at his life. I mean, some years ago he was sitting in Iran, peacefully with his family, and then suddenly there is a sort of satisfaction, dissatisfaction that starts creeping up. Reading a, 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 reading a book, uh, following some rules and regulations, he starts feeling that, no, this can't be God's ways. This can't be God. This is not God. And so he puts that aside. He goes to an underground church. He hears the gospel. He sees the love of God and the justice of God reconciled in Jesus Christ. And he gives his life to Jesus. He gives his life to Christ. And then soon after that, there are two options that he is posed with. Like either he follow Christ and he has to leave, he has to go away from his family, leave his family behind to follow Christ, or he can renounce his faith in Christ and he can continue living with his family peacefully. Which option does he, does he follow? He's sitting with us here, away from his family, away from his wife for more than a year and a half. And last Sunday when we were having lunch, he said in his own voice, Brother, I think, oh, I can't speak like him, <laughs> but, but he said that, Brother, I'm sure that God has a solid reason in all of this being delayed. And when I hear that from him, I'm strengthened, I'm inspired 
to keep going. And I think it should inspire each one of us here. It should inspire each one of us here to see examples of those who are living courageously and boldly for Jesus. And when we do that, when we start living boldly and courageously for Jesus, the end result is that you will end up inspiring other brothers and sisters, other believers around you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that inspiration, that living courageously for Christ might look very different for different people at different stages of life, at different times, it might look very different. For some of you, it might look like starting a faith group during lunchtime in your workplace. And that's a big step. Praise God. Amazing. Courageous. But for some of you, it might look very different. It might be answering to that question. Are you a follower of Christ? Do you follow this guy, Jesus? And your answer, yes. I'm a follower of Christ Jesus. And that is courage. That is boldness. So it might look very different. But I would, leave, I, I would like to leave us with this question in this situation. Are you willing to live that out boldly and courageously for Christ? Are you willing to do that? Each one of us has the opportunity to do that. Let's live courageously for Christ and get out of our comfort zones. And when we do that, we will inspire other brothers and sisters around us. So let's do just that. And thirdly and lastly, the gospel also advances, the gospel does not just advance from bold witness, but in this case, Paul says the gospel also advances out of envy and rivalry. It also advances out of envy and rivalry. Look at verse 15. It says, Some preach Christ from rivalry and envy, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm, I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Now, while Paul was in Rome, others in Rome were preaching the gospel. There were some who were preaching it with goodwill. There were some who were saying, I don't care about my reputation. I'm going to follow Christ and I'm going to preach the gospel and keep going. And they were doing it out of goodwill. They were seeing the, the, the advancement of the gospel. But there was another group who was preaching the gospel, but with rivalry and envy against Paul. They saw this as their opportunity to take their place of prominence in the church. They saw this as their opportunity to become the center of attraction, saying, that, ah, it's about me now. This is the place where I get my prestige. This is the place where I get my fame and honor. So that's how they were, they were preaching the gospel. Paul's place of prominence was taken by them in, in that sense. And they saw this as their opportunity to get focus on themselves. Now, what would, what would be some of the things that we would see if this would be happening in our day and age, in 2021, if someone like Paul would be in prison? What would some of the groups around us would, would say? And I want us to know this, because when things like that happen, we hear things, we hear people say these things. So I, I really want us to be aware of these things. There might be one group which will come up and say, you know, Paul is in prison. You know why? Because God is... Punishing him for a secret sin. Now, might be another group will say, Come on, Paul, if you only had enough faith, you would have come out of the prison. If only you had enough faith to do it. There might be others, like, I'll name this group out loud, the, the Prosperity Gospel group, who would come up and say, If Paul had enough faith, he would have done that, because God wants us to live a healthy and wealthy life. This is the best life that you that you uh, one can live, and God wants us to do that. That's why, come on, Paul, have more faith. Come on, and then you'll be out of the group, out of the out of the prison. I'm not sure how Paul would have felt about these guys, about the prosperity gospel group, but for the others, this is how he felt. Definitely, because they were still preaching the gospel, even if out of rivalry and envy, they were still preaching the correct, the right gospel of Jesus Christ. What was his response? Look at his response. He says, what then? So what? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being preached. Christ is being preached. In other words, I don't give a damn. I don't care what they do to me. I don't care what they think about my reputation. My reputation is safe in God's hands. 
I want to see the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached. That is what he says. As long as the gospel is being preached, as long as people are being saved, as long as people are coming back to God, as long as people are being reconciled back to God, it doesn't matter and I don't care. So it's, if because of my chains, the good news of Jesus is advancing, then these chains don't matter. If my imprisonment is causing brothers and sisters to be much more bold and courageous and advance the gospel in that way, then my imprisonment doesn't matter. If there are some who are envious of me but still preaching the gospel, then this envy and rivalry doesn't matter because lives are being changed and transformed and the gospel is advancing forward. And we can ask this question to ourselves, why these things didn't matter to Paul? Why was it that he, he was like, ah, I don't care. Why these things didn't matter to him at all? Was he some sort of a super Christian? Or was he some sort of a guy who was living completely again in, in denial of his circumstances and no, this is not what is happening, I want to believe this? No, I don't think so. I didn't think so. I believe all of this was possible with Paul because he had really understood the gospel because he had really seen the beauty of the gospel he had really seen the beauty of Jesus Christ he had really seen the manifest glory of God in Jesus and when he had seen that he knew that this life is not what all that it pro promises there is something far much bigger far much better far much more uh, staying forever than this life this is how he understood the gospel and my dear friends, I think my desire in my heart and our desire in our hearts for, for this community is to see the real beauty of Jesus. To see that Jesus, you are not just part of my Sunday morning meeting. You're not just part of my life, but you are the center of my life. Amen. This morning we were singing, Jesus be the center of my life. We want Jesus to be the center of our lives every moment of our lives. We want this story of grace to not just be part of our story, but the whole story itself. This is why we are living for Christ, for Him to be known. As, as Ubume said, Paul said, in, in Christ I have my being, I, I live, I have breathed in Him, in God. And this is not something that we can manufacture in our own selves. We need to go back to God over and over and over again and that's the posture that we have God I'm coming back to you Lord I'm coming back to you if you are someone who is not a Christian this is the opportunity this is like come on this is something beautiful here there's, there's an opportunity for us to be reconciled back to, to the maker of heaven and earth not by following a rule a rule book not by doing a to-do list but by simply putting our trust and our faith in this Jesus Christ. Amen. I just want to share one story, one last story, and then I'll finish. Some of you might have heard of Graham Stewart Staines. He was an Australian missionary who, was, who went to India in some, somewhere in the 1960s, mid-1960s. He, with his wife and three children, one, do one daughter, Esther and Philip and Timothy, two sons, they stayed in, uh, in India, in the eastern part of India, Odisha, a state of India, and they served there to, to care for the poor extreme po in an area of extreme poverty, where people uh, were hit by leprosy, and they stayed there for a good 35 years almost. But the people around there, there were some who were these frenetic and um, fundamentalist Belonged to, the, belonged to the fundamentalist Hindu group, Vajrandal. And they didn't like what Ram and his wife Gladys and the children were doing. In 1999, it was a cold January night, the father decided to take his two sons to a Christian conference, a forest camp. And they went to that camp on their way in the night. They, they took a break from their journey. And because it was cold, they stayed inside their jeep. They said, this is where we sleep. Two sons, 10-year-old, 6-year-old, and this dad. And suddenly a mob 
in midnight, a mob of around 50 people came with torches and arms and they set the jeep on fire. This dad, these two sons, it says they tried to escape but they couldn't. They were locked from outside. They were burned alive. And when you hear stories like these, you almost ask, what's the point? What's the point of all of this? When you see Paul's situation in this in this Roman prison, you say, he's one guy who is, who is the apostle, who is the evangelist, the one who is advancing, the one who is sold out completely for Christ, and he's the one who is advancing. God, now he's in prison. What's the point? What's the point? How is the gospel advancing? And this is how the gospel is advancing still. And this is where it gets personal. By the way, um, Graham's wife, Gladys, and, his, uh, and their daughter, Esther, they didn't leave India then and there saying that, oh, my husband is, is dead now, I can't do anything without him. But they stayed for another 16, good 17 years there, Amen. serving in the same place, serving the same people, demonstrating the power of the gospel, not just forgiving their enemies, but actually loving them day in, day out, caring for those lepers, caring for those extreme poverty, for those who were hit by extreme poverty. They stayed there for a good 17 years. And then you still ask this, what's the point of all of this? And I said, this is where it gets personal. About 10 or 12 years later, God chooses a man from the same state, Odisha, with the same sort of ideologies, with the same sort of mentality that Bajrang Dal and Hinduism and nothing else. You don't want Christians here. And God takes him and moves him to another city for work. And he's of the same mentality, and he is at a point of being troubled in his life. He ends up going to church. He ends up hearing the gospel. And then he, inside, he's, he's battling. No, I don't want this. I don't want this. I was against it completely. I don't want this. I'm going to go back. But then he finds himself coming back over and over and over again. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus, keeps dripping in his heart, in his mind, drop by drop by drop. The love of God softens his heart. And then eventually, over a course of months and years, he becomes a Christian. He gives his life to Christ. And then he gets baptized on the same day as, as I was baptized with him. We were together baptized in the same church in the same, on the same morning. We were baptized together, and now this guy, Jeevan Kumar, with his wife, Rakhi, and a year-old son, they are being trained to go for church planting by Reasons Beyond School of Leadership in India. Probably in the next months or years, we might, we might pray for them. We say, God, be with them as they advance the gospel where you have put them, where you have anchored them. This is the point. Talk about God using even our worst situations and circumstances for the advance of the gospel. My dear friends, this is why we breathe. If you put your trust in Jesus, that is, that is our mission. That is what God has done in our lives and simply we say it out loud. And sometimes, due to the circumstances and situations, we sort of move away from that. Like, no, 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 this is my life now. I have to work, I have to, I have to get money, I have to store this, I have to do this, I have to do that. But then God does things in your life where He says, come on, let's, let's put the focus back in the right place. Let's move back to the right place. Let's, let's, become, let's go to the center again. And I believe that this is what God is doing through His Word in my life, in all our lives. Come on, let's... Let, let, let the main point be the main point. And this is the main point. The advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, through whom and only through whom, mankind is reconciled back to God. How do we respond? I'm a little lost here. How do we respond? This is not something that we manufacture in ourselves our hearts and our minds that, yeah, come on, let's do it. 
is something that we keep coming back to God. God, you do it in me. If you're not a follower of Christ, come to him and ask him, God, I need you. Jesus, I want to give my life into your hands. If you're following Jesus, Lord, I want to be useful to you. I want to be fruitful in the advance of your kingdom, wherever you have placed me. In my workplace, in my neighborhood, in my situation, in my school, anywhere you have placed me, Lord, I want to be fruitful for you, King Jesus. As Darren and, and, and the others come and sing over us and, and give us words of worship, let's look to God once again. Let's look to this Jesus who is the giver of all good things, including Him who strengthens us, the Holy Spirit. Let's ask for the Spirit of God to come and strengthen us and embolden us and make us more courageous to live for Him.